Aspen Road, it's time! T'as encore des enfants? Pas de problème, c'est quand tu veux, toi, des pieds, tu te crois, toi? Pourquoi c'est trop tard? I don't want to hear anybody saying no. A Palm d'Or winner sailing the high seas of satire. The platinum bombshell returns to our screens in a new incarnation and a touching tale of modern family dynamics. That's all coming up in today's film show. And for that, I'm joined by Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Now we're starting with Swedish writer-director Ruben Oslund's latest film. It won the top prize in Cannes this past May. Triangle of Sadness is out this week in France. This was his second Golden Palm uh, a win following The Square, which made fun of the art world. Two awards, then, from a very big film festival would suggest he's a pretty big deal. He's entertaining. Each of his films has at least one situation you'll probably never, ever forget. But in my humble opinion, this was not the best film in competition this year. Still, uh, this irreverent look at the ideological pitfalls of contemporary life is definitely worth seeing. One of the main characters is a British male model who's on the decline, although only in his 20s, uh, because he's starting to get a few wrinkles, including, this gives it the title, this sort of wrinkle area here uh, between your eyebrows. Okay, well, let's get a glimpse of the tone and the circumstances in Triangle of Sadness. So, is this runway casting for a grumpy brand or a smiley brand? <laughs> so, it's a grumpy brand, yeah. Congratulations! Show me that Balenciaga look. Oh, Suddenly, I'm dressed in something way less expensive. It's H&M! Yay! Balenciaga! And H&M! Balenciaga! And H&M! <laughs> It looks paid for the tickets. Not bad, huh? <laughs> so what do you do? I sell s***. And very sadly, the lady we saw in red just there, played by actress Shelby Dean, she died suddenly just a month ago, and she certainly had a great comic talent. That's something we see throughout the film. Oh, the comic beats in this movie are all spot on. The film boasts wonderful set pieces, uh, many of them revolving around arguments and has things to say about social class that are definitely worth hammering home, and hammer he does. This film pokes fun at where insane wealth is likely to originate, and it warns that it's always good to have a few practical skills to fall back on. Uh, if you find yourself stranded on an uninhabited island, uh, once we had my kingdom for a horse and uh, now we have my Rolex for a pretzel. <laughs> I must admit, I laughed a lot during this film. Uh, well, next, we're going to French writer-director Rebecca Zlotowski. Now, she's made a film about a topic that we don't see that often on screen. What happens in a new romance if one of the partners has a child from a previous relationship? It's called Other People's Children. Tell us about this one. Well, Zlotowski is 42, and she's interested in one of the glitches in the road to gender equality, where the guys will always have the upper hand, namely that there's a time limit on uh, whether a woman can become a biological mother or not. The director gives us a whirlwind opening in which we meet Rachel, a high school teacher, and her new sweetheart, Ali, uh, an automotive engineer. And she's suddenly as close as a 40-year-old woman can be to a giggly teenager. This new relationship is really sexy, and it makes her feel giddy. Ali has a four and a half year old daughter, Layla, and amicably shares custody with the girl's mother. Rachel gradually grows attached to Layla, but as a de facto stepmother, can't quite get her bearings. Is she getting the short end of the stick, or is she supposed to be grateful that she has a stick in the first place? She'd like to have a child of her own, but Ali is non-committal because he can afford to be. Okay, well let's get a glimpse of this pleasing relationship with an underlying sore point. Euh, bonjour Alice, je suis Rachel. Maman. Bonjour Rachel. Mais alors, oui, les bisous, les bonjours à Rachel. Hmm. Pourquoi Rachel est tout le temps là Moi, je veux qu'il s'en aille. Mais si tu crois un jour que... Tu Elle a 5 ans. Pas t'apprendre qu'à cet âge-là, ça veut absolument rien dire. Tu dirais que tu fais semblant de pas comprendre que je m'attache à elle. À la fin de la journée, c'est vous, son père et sa mère. Pour toujours. Que je resterai une figurante. T'exagères. That central couple there played by Virginie Efira and Rosti Zem. And it does sometimes feel like we can't make a film without them here in <laughs> France because they are everywhere. That's pretty accurate. But if you can get performers this gifted and this versatile, why wouldn't you? Rachel's feelings are always understandable. She's accommodating, giving, but not sure how adamant to be about her longing for a child and whether there should be certain boundaries with little Layla. The movie starts with a gorgeous shot of the Eiffel Tower, but then fools us by showing the non-tourist 
touristy Paris, where people dash around, race for the metro, have boring meetings at work, and the film definitely shows us that being a parent is a lot of work. Uh, the film goes unpredictable places. It turns out that, like Slatovsky herself, Rachel's mother died when she was very young, and she misses her imagined guidance at this crucial moment of her life. The film intelligently explores the idea that some adults can influence other people's children for the better. Very interesting. Well, next to a film streaming on Netflix as of this week and something that's been 15 years in the making, screenwriter, director Andrew Dominic's adaptation of Joyce Carol Oates' book about the imagined inner life of Marilyn Monroe. And she's played here by Cuban actress Ana de Armas. Let's get a feel for the film. When I come out of my dressing room, I'm Norma Jean. I'm still hurt when the camera is rolling. Marilyn Monroe only exists on the screen. So, Lisa, just to go back to the book briefly, it was very, very long, quite hard to fit into a movie. Do you think that the director's hit pulled it off here? Uh, well, Oates herself just told The New Yorker it's, quote, a work of art. It's an uncomfortable viewing experience carried by a stupendous central performance. Oates's novel was inspired by the undeniable traumas underlying the undeniable public triumph of Marilyn's life. Norma Jean Baker never knew her father, who left before she was born, and her mother was a paranoid schizophrenic who tried to do her daughter physical harm while planting the psychic harm of insisting that her absent father was super handsome and would come to see her soon. Oates says that Marilyn was a bit like Emma Bovary in Hollywood. She built up her own view of things. That view was underpinned by seeking a father figure and having uh, the men who applied for the job give up in eventual dismay. Her husband baseball legend Joe DiMaggio, revered playwright Arthur Miller. The film is merciless in its depiction of how she could be treated as an accessory by President John F. Kennedy. Now, The New Yorker called Oates's book hallucinatory fiction. The director calls his film an emotional nightmare fair, fairy tale, emotional nightmare fairy tale. Netflix subscribers will call it more prosaically something to watch on TV. And the streaming service clearly hopes that dangling the prospect of the leading lady running around naked it always in context will attract new subscribers. Something for everyone, perhaps. Well, let's hear from Joyce Carol Oates on Marilyn Monroe when she was interviewed by France 24 a while back. I saw a photograph of Norma Jean Baker when she was 17 years old. She had brown hair. She was not glamorous. She didn't look like Marilyn Monroe. And I thought, what a mystery it is that that girl of 17 would become, in a few years, Marilyn Monroe, this iconic famous and doomed actress who would then die at the age of 36. To me, the whole thing was shrouded in mystery. And so to explore the mystery, I wanted to write the novel. Now, this blends nicely with other people's children because Marilyn desperately wanted to be a mother. And it is fascinating to me that so soon after the U.S. Supreme Court repealed the national right to obtain a legal abortion, we're showing that Marilyn may have been subjected to a studio-mandated abortion she absolutely did not want in order to make a movie that called for tight gowns. The film is very deft at showing us that Norma Jean Baker was very smart and funny and prodigiously talented in addition to sporting uh, natural endowments that were appealing to contemplate, and that what we know as Marilyn Monroe was an act, a character she invented and played so very well that she couldn't get out from under her creation. Joyce Carol Oates told French Vanity Fair that it's impressive that a man did such an excellent job of getting inside the head of a woman. Now, whether that's a place most people wish to venture is another thing, but in my opinion, Andrew Dominic does take us to harrowing places, most of them rooted in Norma Jean's traumatic childhood. Mm, and indeed, the film got an NC-17 rating in the US, which means you have to be 18 to see it in a theatre, right? Yes, well, back to Oates. She said that she imagines that hinged on the distressing sex scene involving Marilyn and President John F. Kennedy. I think that scene is very well depicted, but I've spoken to people who find it distasteful and over the top. Oates says she thinks that young people a year away from being able to legally purchase a gun should be able to handle a scene about how not to treat a woman. And she told the New Yorker that what really happened to Marilyn was far worse than anything depicted in the movie. Now, the film is anything but a 
linear classic biopic. It's a sensation-soaked recreation of real incidents melded with states of mind. And the film Blonde suggests that we think about images, about what we think we know, about public figures, entertainers, about the nature of fame. Okay, well, you've definitely sold it to me. I'll be <laughs> checking that out. Well, finally, it's time for the 33rd Dinard Film Festival, which is devoted to bringing British films here to France in a Brittany resort town. Tell us more. Oh, this is a film festival in France that is ideal for visitors who don't speak French. I love the setting. I applaud the programming. When it began, the British film industry was edging toward extinction. It's fair to say it has come <laughs> roaring back. Now, I'm looking forward to more films than I'll have time to see. It's a very compact event, packed into just five days. But I'll admit, I'm especially curious about Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, starring Emma Thompson as a mature woman who hires a younger male sex worker. I have heard very good things about that one. Thank you very much for that wrap-up this week, Lisa. We'll leave you with a look at Emma Thompson in that film. Good luck to you, Leo Grande. The Dinard Film Festival is running until October 2nd. And remember, you can get more movie news on our website. We're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. I, I guess I'm frustrated. Is Leo Grande your real name? Thinking about all the Places I should have been by now. No, I simply don't understand why you're doing this. This to save up for our college. Oh, how wonderful. Are you really? No. <laughs> I've always been ashamed of my body. Your body's beautiful. I wish you could see that. Everyone wants something different. I don't judge my clients, lest they're total arseholes. 